So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Lionel Barber. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Financial Times. Um, we have a world-class panel uh, before us this afternoon to discuss the question of rebuilding Europe. Uh, you have active participants in the discussion. Now, as you well know, the, uh, this year, uh, Europe remains at the epicenter of the sovereign debt crisis. That crisis is now in its fifth year, and it has posed serious challenges both for uh, the management of the monetary union in Europe, but also in terms of governance. In uh, the panel to my left, I'm going to uh, introduce the participants and then I'm going to ask one question. We'll have a short discussion on the panel and then hopefully, because we believe in ac interactivity, we're going to open up questions to the audience. Um, I'd like to first introduce uh, Bronislaw Koromowski, who is the president of Poland. To my To my left, Helling Torning Schmidt, who is the Prime Minister of Denmark. <laughs> then, Jyrki Tepani Katainen, who is the Prime Minister of Finland. <laughs> and then, to my immediate left, Enda Kenny, the Tisuk of Ireland. First, President Komorowski, tell us please what lessons you draw in terms of structural, economic and political challenges from the crisis to date. Polish experience of uh, the life at crisis is quite long. Because our good and continuous political and economic and civilizational development, we started uh, on this path 20 years ago, and we started with a very deep crisis. Actually, it was the economic collapse. It was the necessity to introduce very deep structural reforms in all the areas of our life, in terms of the state system, of the state social system, economic system. We had to move on from the totalitarian regime to democracy. So we look at a crisis today as something which is an easier challenge, a task which is easier than our past task. We believe that the European crisis, the sovereign debt crisis, economic crisis, that this is the crisis which can absolutely be overcome if we have enough courage to change ourselves. The European crisis today is mainly the crisis of trust of citizens of the European countries to the institutions of uh, integrating Europe. There is also a crisis of trust to the state of economy, the state of finance in Europe, as expressed by the markets. And I am convinced that something of great significance is to rebuild trust to the European Union, understood as the community, understood as a challenge, and the name of it is our common future. That is why Poland attaches so much importance to keeping the internal cohesion of the European Union, to strengthening the institutions which are the emanation, that are the representation of all the states uh, that make up the Europeans. European Union. Thank you, President. Uh, I now turn uh, to the Prime Minister of Denmark, a relative newcomer to the European Council, but one who brings a special perspective from Copenhagen. Uh, thank you very much. I have really been looking forward to, uh, to this discussion but I'd like to start with, um, with actually questioning its title, which is about rebuilding uh, Europe. It implies that we need to build, rebuild Europe. And I must be frank with you all, I don't think we need to rebuild uh, Europe. Um, I do understand, and I spoke to several people yesterday, uh, Americans, other people from uh, other continents, 
say, looking at Europeans and saying, oh, why is everything also, always so slow? Uh, why are you not taking decisions in a faster uh, way? I know, I know that everyone is waiting for Europe to take decisions. But I think we also need to remember in this, in this time of trouble that Europe is, um, has created a truly unique model of cooperation. Um, the U U European Union is an achievement that we should all be proud of. Um, and um, I think it is very, very important to s remember that what we have created in Europe is uh, rule of law by 27 member state states that have decided that it is not might or power that is deciding in Europe, but rule of law. And we should be proud of that achievement. Um, I will, however, concede that some kind of rebuilding is, is necessary not of the EU or Europe, or the institutions, um, but uh, of course of the European economies. They need to be re rebuilt and, uh, and in doing that, we need to remember that Europe can help in doing that, but also remember that the core of the problem is not Europe, but actually um, the uh, profligacy of the European economies. This is very important because everyone turns to Europe and demands answers I think this is right, but the core of the problem is not Europe, it is uh, the lack of discipline uh, in, in budgets, in terms of the budgets in the European member states. Um, that's one for important uh, point to rem remember. The second point to remember when we are trying to restore our economy and have austerity in, many of our, um, in, many, in our economies, in many of our member states, is also to remember that in doing that, in going through this very difficult phase, we mustn't forget our values. We mustn't forget that Europe, the European Union sets itself apart, not by, only by being a, a union where we have rule of law, but also by uh, insisting that we want a social market economy. This is our values, and the time we, go, we are going through now should not let us forget that this is part of our core values uh, in Europe. And I think we need to remember that in the coming years. The third thing I want to point out is that it is very easy in times of trouble like that, like we have now, to of course blame Europe, I've said that already, but also blame our institutions, our ways of doing things. But I still feel that it is in times of trouble that we should turn towards our institutions turn towards what we call in the European Union our community method and rely on our institutions rather than um, being angry or, or annoyed with our institutions. So then Denmark, who is, who's just taken over the presidency of the, uh, Euro, of the Council, is very, very keen to make clear all the time that we have to lift ourselves by producing tangible, useful results for our citizens we have to use our institutions to doing, in doing that. And we also have to make sure that it is not Europe's fault that we have the problems that we have. It is not because we had Europe, perhaps it's because we had too little Europe that we, ha we have the situation we have right now. We understand the big responsibility that we have. We are, all, we are meeting on Monday to try to uh, set the framework for, our, for more discipline in our European economies. And I can assure you and the rest of the world who might be, be watching us that we will do everything we can to put Europe back on its track, restore our economy, have the necessary discipline, create more growth and uh, jobs, and at the same time remembering our core values which is solidarity and a social market economy. Thank you, Prime Minister. I shall uh, take your warning to heart and I shall avoid all references to Europe as a construction site. Thank you. Uh, um, I now turn to Prime Minister Katainen. A special perspective from you, sir. You've, your, your economy too went through some great structural upheaval in the early 90s, but at that time, of course, you had the flexibility of an exchange rate. Well, yeah, actually, there are three issues which are on my, on my mind at the moment. We, uh, we learned a lot from our own crisis in the beginning of the 90s, and one of the, one of the issues which is similar with our thin crisis, with the current European crisis, is that we have to regain the confidence. Uh, we cannot expect any kind of growth 
whatever we do if there is no confidence. And that's why we have to be bold enough to make all the necessary austerity measures what is needed. Because otherwise, even though somebody is saying that uh, if you are cutting budget and if you are raising taxes, there is no growth. But uh, now we are not talking about the cyclical program, pro problem. Instead, we are talking about the confidence problem. And that's why we have to strengthen the confidence. And this is number one, what I wanted to say. And uh, at the same time, when we are raising taxes and cutting budgets, we can we can do other measures which are very growth friendly, especially the measures which enhance or strengthen the competitiveness. For instance, what the Ireland has done already, uh, it's a very good example that the country in crisis can gain the confidence back by doing good politics and, and, and for instance, concentrating on the competitiveness issues. And there are lots of things to do uh, with, other, uh, with all, uh, all our European Union member countries in this field. The second point is we need better rules. Um, as Helle already said, it's not, we are not in the crisis because we are Europeans, but we have not had uh, rules which are good enough. And therefore, we need rules. We already share the common values, but the rules are the vehicle how to put those values in func uh, functioning. And there, therefore, we, we need better rules. And there, there we have uh, already worked quite, quite um, far. The third and the final point is the better and more efficient EU. Um, and there I see that the, we have to avoid intergovernmentalism. Crisis is not the excuse of uh, increasing intergovernmentalism because when we share the common values and sharing the same values, then we have to have the common rule base and there we need a community method, which, mean, which means that we have to have well-functioning and strong commission, which is kind of referee between the countries, which is interpreting uh, the rules. So there, those are the three, three points, confidence, uh, better rules, and uh, community method or more efficient EU. Thank you, Prime Minister. Would you like to just clarify that last point? When you say we don't need more intergovernmentalism, Surely the new fiscal compact will be an intergovernmental agreement amongst the Eurozone. Unfortunately, yes. We, we, tried, to, we tried to make all those uh, changes within the framework of a uh, treaty, but it wasn't possible because of obvious reasons. Everybody knows it. Britain wasn't ready to, to allow to change the treaty, and this was the only option which we had. But uh, this is better than nothing. So uh, if almost everybody uh, will, will uh, take part uh, yeah. into the new fiscal compact, it's more or less like a treaty. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And now the uh, special perspective from Dublin, which has been in the eye of the storm, but where many things, interesting things, have been going on. Sir. Well, uh, first of all, I think it's important to set a little background here. The European Union grew out of a mood and a change to prevent human slaughter, which will, where 60 million people lost their lives in two world wars. And the Union was founded on the principles of uh, cooperation, of solidarity, and of trust. The reason this crisis has grown to the extent that it has in the last couple of years is by incompetence of some governments, by lack of concentration and focus on what Europe should be about, and by interminable interwrangling between institutions and politicians about national issues. And national issues are very important because politics is always about people. What I've been saying for quite some time, that lack of trust, Lionel, was evident. Not only in the markets having no trust in Europe, because they didn't trust them to make the decisions and follow through, but also between many of the, uh, the governments themselves, that the level of trust in terms of the, the principles upon which Europe was founded wasn't evident. Now, I think that in the last period, in the last recent period, I see growing signs of renewed confidence among the leaders who sit around the table, where we're privileged to, to sit on occasions as leaders of our countries. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Firstly, 
The drafting of the wording of the, uh, of the intergovernmental agreement has by and large uh, come to this point without any great wrangling like you used to have on lots of other occasions. Secondly, the decision uh, that was agreed to bring forward the ESM with its 500 billion fund to an earlier date and to review that, um, that capacity of that later. Thirdly, to allow the EFSF to run in parallel to that with the funds that have been unused, which are about, 200 and, which are about, um, which are about 250 billion. And uh, fourthly, the diminishing political sort of controversy that there was about the European Central Bank and its role in uh, financial markets and the sovereign, uh, and the sovereign, uh, sovereign issues. I think there are examples in the recent past of a growing sense of trust. So I would like to think um, that we can conclude on Monday and that the European leaders can focus on the potential of the single market and the European Union. I support what's been said both by the President, by Hella and by Irki. This is about the future, creating that future, and the future is the only place where we have to live. So it's, it's a necessity that political leaders understand that their remit from their people is, is always for a period, and in that period they should work together in the common interests of the peoples of Europe. So as a country that's a member of the Eurozone within the European Union, from the currency perspective, it's very necessary that there be a defense of that currency and that there be no um, inconsistency or lack of confidence about that. That's in the interest of things that we have spoken about uh, as different leaders in respect of investment, job opportunities, the future of our peoples, careers for young people, and these can all happen um, because of political decisions. I have to say, this is the time to be in politics, to deal with this crisis. It might be very nice sometimes, but I have never been as confident that politics and trust among political leaders can actually uh, sort out this particular problem and allow Europe to flourish in the way that I know that it can. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, there are a number of fascinating points raised by those interventions. I, I'd just like to seek, if I may, uh, one or two clarifications. Um, first of all, um, Madam Thorning-Schmidt, you, you said you expressed some reservations about building Europe and about institution building, and obviously Denmark is not part of the Eurozone, but as uh, the monetary union develops, um, and as measures are taken to ensure that the monetary union survives and thrives, surely there will be new institution building, more rules, uh, and indeed the British government, for example, has urged there for to be deeper fiscal integration. What is your perspective? Is that something you see inevitably? You're not worried about being outside it? I don't know, I think I expressed myself very clearly if that was your impression that I was against institutions because I was trying to express uh, rather the opposite. I think it is in a time of turmoil, turmoil that we have right now where we have all this talk of crisis, all these things that we should preserve our way of doing things. What is our way of doing things in Europe? It is that we have rule of law. It is that we have strong institutions. It is that we have a European Court of Justice if we don't agree. It is that we all have to comply with the rules. And if we don't, we even have sanctions if we don't comply with the rules. So I am in very much in favor um, of a rule-based uh, EU. This has always been an advantage for a small member state or small member states. But my point is also that it is a, to, an advantage for all member states if we have rule of law, strong institutions, the community method as, as we like to talk about. And it is exactly when we have problems that we should maintain that, that way of working together. Right now we have economic difficulties and we are trying with the so-called fiscal compact to work uh, on, on uh, solving these economic difficulties. I completely agree with Jürgen, who says it would have been better if we could have done that within our treaties. We couldn't, so this is the second best solution. It is still a good solution. This is what we are working on now, and hopefully when the three of us meet on Monday again, we will conclude 
um, a framework for the next way of disciplining our economies and keeping um, the agreements that we make with each other. Fine. Okay, Mr. Katainen, then I'd like to ask President Komarovsky a question, please. Two short, uh, two short comments on what Taylor said. The importance of the institutions uh, comes from the fact that uh, the, the EU must be a rule-based union. And uh, now we are talking about the legitimacy of the EU. And there, because we are dealing with the extremely difficult crisis, people are quite worried. They are worried what, uh, what will happen to our country, how much uh, we have to pay the other country's bill, and stuff like this. So there, we, there is no room for kind of uh, uh, unclarity. Who is preparing and what? And therefore, we need strong institutions because uh, we have to, at the same time, when dealing with the crisis, we have to take care of the, the legitimacy of the EU. The second point, uh, even though we are now preparing intergovernmental agreement on is economic issues or rules, uh, it does not that much differ whether the country is in the Eurozone or outside of the Eurozone, because now we are creating rules which are common sense rules, which are good for everybody. Uh, of course, th there, are, uh, there are issues in which uh, Eurozone countries must probably go deeper, but basically now we are creating rules which are good for everybody, no matter whether the country is using Euro or, or Krone or whatever the currency. Okay, l let me just take up this question of maintaining cohesion even as certain countries cooperate more tightly and deeply. Uh, President Komorowski, your Poland has aspirations to join the single currency. How do, you, how do you think the rest of the Union, the Eurozone members, should conduct themselves in order that those outside are not in any way disfavored? Ja sobie myślę w ten sposób, well, że think, y, źle się dzieje, jeżeli Europa zajmuje się really tylko i wyłącznie Europe, uh, problemami wewnętrznymi. With an, uh, with niewątpliwie do opisu kryzysu, który pan przedstawił, należy w moim przekonaniu dodać również wielkie wyzwania z tytułu gigantycznej konkurencji w wymiarze ogólnoświatowym. Europa, jeśli Europe, nie zdobędzie się na szybszy rozwój, utraci może swoją faster, pozycję lidera, e, lidera, jeśli chodzi o potęgę gospodarczą w skali świata. Europa nie może utrzymać swojej pozycji, a jednocześnie swojej atrakcyjności, swojego wzorca, do naśladowania we w każdym innym obszarze, in nie tylko gospodarczym, ale także w sposobu życia, and, and uh, jeśli chodzi także właśnie o stosunek do prawa. Wszystkie te imponderabilia, które decydują o odmienności kultury, cywilizacji europejskiej. Europa nie może utrzymać Europe tej swojej pozycji zdolności do konkurowania w obliczu powstawania nowych, wielkich ośrodków rozwoju na świecie, jeśli nie zdobędzie się na, po pierwsze, uruchomienie źródeł własnego wzrostu gospodarczego, po drugie, odwagi w poszerzaniu, sposobu, w poszerzaniu własnych idei, na przykład w ramach współpracy z krajami, z regionami sąsiednimi, jeśli nie będzie aktywna w, w, w polu nieograniczonym tylko i wyłącznie do rozwiązywania I z tego punktu widzenia niesłychanie jest ważne to, aby w rozstrzyganiu spraw istotnych dla przyszłości Europy brały udział te kraje, które mogą wnosić i witalność, i własny sukces. Nie chcę podawać tu przykładu polskiego, ale przykład szwedzki jest ważny. Szwecja też jest poza strefą euro, a przecież 
wnosi w tej chwili niesłychanie wiele, jeśli chodzi o nadzieję na rozwój gospodarczy Unii Europejskiej jako I obawiamy się w Polsce, że takie bardzo jurydyczne, ograniczające podejście do rozwiązywania problemów strefy euro może ograniczać Unię Europejską w jej koniecznym jakby procesie odzyskiwania vitalności, odzyskiwania energii, także w obszarze gospodarczym. Obawiamy się tego, że strefa euro, jeśli ograniczymy myślenie o w przyszłości Unii Europejskiej do myślenia o uzdrowieniu strefy euro stracimy bardzo wiele szans. My jesteśmy zwolennikami, aby myśleć w kategoriach wykraczających poza ocenę kryzysu jako zjawiska dotyczącego i dotykającego tylko i wyłącznie kraje strefy euro. Before I turn to Prime Minister Kenny, just a quick follow-up here. Uh, you offered some mild criticism of the excessively legalistic approach to resolving the Euro's problems. But surely, if you have rules, you need that they are enforced, and therefore, by law, a legalistic approach is required. Otherwise, there's no confidence or trust. Ja się w stu procentach z tym well, zgadzam, tylko saying, to nie Polska naruszyła well, zasady i, i, i nie naruszyła także well, nie, czegoś, bez czego się nie da prowadzić polityka i zaufania. Well, Rzeczywiście mamy do czynienia z pewnymi zjawiskami, które niszczą zaufanie wzajemne i ograniczają to zaufanie na przyszłość i trzeba szukać rozwiązań, mechanizmów prawnych, które by tego rodzaju ryzyko na przyszłość ograniczyły albo zlikwidowały. Ale nie powinno to stać w sprzeczności z zasadą współdecydowania wszystkich krajów członkowskich Unii Europejskiej. To mogę dać przykład Polski, jak Polska ma w konstytucji wpisaną od kilkunastu lat zasadę nie pozwalającą na zwiększanie deficytu budżetowego, którą dopiero kraje strefy euro teraz będą wprowadzały. My jesteśmy pod tym względem uzbrojeni w różne rozwiązania, które chyba jeśli nie dają gwarancji, to zwiększają szanse na, na rzeczywiste podstawy do zaufania wzajemnego i poczucia pewności w ramach Unii Europejskiej. Thank you, President Obramowski. Prime Minister, what has been essentially said on this platform this afternoon is that the original design for monetary union was flawed. Sanctions were ignored. The no bailout clause has proven to be empty. Oversight of competitiveness questions, current account deficits, all this went by the by. So in, we're now rebuilding the monetary union. I think it would be very interesting to listen a little to what Ireland has done in the last two years after a spectacular property crash to show what is necessary, if you like, to ensure if you really want to be membership of this Eurozone, this is, these are the steps you need to take. It would be quite interesting to listen. Well, we're not there yet. Um, I think it's important to say that uh, Ireland has been a very strong uh, member of the European Union since we joined back in the 70s. We've had quite a number of referenda on European issues. We've always supported those. Sometimes when they weren't explained properly to people, they may have had to have a second, uh, a second opportunity to make that decision. But what happened in our country was that people simply went mad with borrowing. And the extent of personal credit, uh, personal wealth created on credit, uh, was done between people, uh, banks, a system that uh, spawned greed to a point where it just went out of control completely with the spectacular crash that you mentioned. The country borrowed over 60 billion at excessive rates. Um, and the IMF uh, eventually came in with the Troika. So what's happened in the meantime? 
Well, last year, in a general election, people gave a very clear mandate to the government I lead, the strongest mandate in the history of our country, to sort out this problem. And that meant explaining to people the reality of the scale of the challenge, the truth of where Ireland actually stood. I think it's, um, it's got to be understood that people are very pragmatic and that the political process and politicians should never underestimate people's capacity to want to assist government in helping out problems like this. So we've had to take drastic action in terms of complying with the conditions of the arrival of the Troika. Now we've had five different assessments by Troika from the ECB, the Commission and the IMF. And on each of those uh, assessments there has been a deeply uh, intensive analysis of Ireland's performance for the period past and Ireland's intentions in the, con in the context of the uh, Memorandum of Understanding for the future. And I'm glad to say that our people understand the scale of that challenge and we have measured up in each and every one of those conditions. But that has meant a reduction in um, public salaries, it's meant a reduction in the cost of the public sector, the size of the public sector, increases in the pension age, but as a consequence you've had increases in competitiveness uh, and opportunities that have presented themselves as a consequence. As Hella said, people have refocused on their values and what it is that they want to contribute to the well-being of the country. So we're in a program, Lionel. It runs until the end of 2013. Um, yesterday, as a small measure, a small step of confidence, the um, Treasury Management Agency, which was reported in your own paper, um, reported on a debt swap. It changed from January 2014 to January 2015 of uh, three and a half billion. Now, that's only a small step in what is a very long journey for us. But people become frustrated if they don't see results. And they want to see where the new, where the light shines and where the days of prosperity return. And that's why it's very important for government to be able to continuously interact with people and explain the journey to the implementation of the plan. And that's why in the context of the European Union and our colleagues around the table, that support and that cooperation and that solidarity is fundamental to any country making its progress here. So our attributes are we've always been a small open economy, very strong on exports because we export 90% of what we produce. And that means that on the basis of, of us, let us say, being a country uh, that has political stability, and a young population, energetic education system, able to meet the demands and the requirements of the flexibilities that are coming with nanotechnology and digital the internet and all of these things that are changing the world we live in as we speak. Right. So we want to be part of that future. We recognize we've got a challenge in closing the deficit we have of 15, 16 billion, but also to avail of the opportunities that clearly exist as being a member of what is the most powerful trading bloc in the world. And if, as leaders, we can focus through the presidencies on what it is that we have to do, my belief is that the, um, the future of the union can actually be very strong and very profitable. I'll give you examples of where we would be later. Things like the single market, which you've discussed before, the single patent said to work outside. If you have an innovation and you look for a patent in Finland or in Denmark, it should be applicable across the Union. That's what the single market is about. So is the Irish medicine, uh, the Irish cod liver oil for export to southern Europe? Because conventional wisdom is that this kind of adjustment, severe adjustment, can so easily lead to social unrest. And indeed, Prime Minister Mario Monti just the other day was warning that you know, there could be a backlash unless there is something in return for these austerity measures. How do you see this? Change is always difficult, and when people become used to a particular structure and a set way of life, it's very difficult to change that in the common interest and the common good. I spoke to um, Prime Minister Monti uh, just this week. Um, he comes from a background of a status as a former commissioner understanding the institutions, but bringing 
a sort of a non-political perspective to dealing with Italy's, uh, Italy's problems. From our perspective, as I said, it's always important to explain to people what you're doing and to explain to them that when you get to, to a further point along the road, what that actually means. But what do people what do people see from politics? Okay, they may say they're all cynical, they're all for themselves, or they're all the same. But when you focus on what politics should actually deliver for people, it is jobs, employment, careers, family opportunities, that's when they see the relevance of hard political decisions that result in benefit for countries and for people. So if you ask me to transfer the cod liver oil or the medicine that Ireland has to take, not a tariff which is it. not nice, believe you me, uh, to other places. This is also a matter of culture. Yeah. It's a matter of how, how you want to participate in the union of which you remember. And as has been pointed out by all three here, if you sign on, there are conditions and rules and regulations. You cannot throw these out the window and forget them and just avail of the benefits. You've got to work to make that happen. Prime Minister Katanin. Yeah. I think the Irish model to regain the confidence is the model which we need all, in all over the Europe. I don't, actually, actually, I don't see any other choice. If, if we are lacking or the country is lacking of confidence, the country is lacking of confidence in its own citizens, its own companies, it's lacking of confidence of the investors from outside, what you can do? You, ha you have to do whatever it takes to regain the confidence. And there is no shortcut to heaven. And uh, I, mean, I mean, the confidence comes when everybody knows what is bad and what is good, what is right and what is wrong. It might be painful, but if you say that the good is bad, or other ways around, bad is good, then there is no confidence. So you just have to look the truth to the eyes and do whatever is needed. Of course, I know everywhere there are risks of social unrest. But the, if, if, the people's soul is constructed so that, that if, if the soul, by your message, it, it can accept even severe or, or bad tasting medicines. But if you don't trust on the message, if your soul says that the, uh, the thing what the politician is saying is not true, then the bad tasting medicine is very difficult to accept. So we just have to go through the, the grey stone. Nevertheless, it was very hard. Um, because, for instance, in our case, uh, last year, uh, we turned what was 10 years of a balance of payments deficit into a surplus for the first time. And that's because people, when they, when they give a mandate and they, they give trust to government and say, here's the plan, let's all work together in this interest, things can actually happen faster than people might imagine. Okay, uh, Prime Minister, uh, very quickly, and then I'm going to open up. Yeah, I don't know how quick uh, it will be. Um, I think it's very important when we talk about austerity and talk about how we have to change our societies and how people have to bear this burden, burden. But our, there are at least two things we have to bear in mind. One is that if we are going to have austerity measured and consolidate our economies, which I firmly believe we, we do have to do, all the countries that can find it within their own economic um, possibilities should also focus on growth. I think people will accept austerity if we also talk about growth and jobs. That's one thing. The other thing is that when we have austerity, the burdens should be equally distributed. What do I mean by that? I mean that everyone should be part of this austerity. And basically, I very much agree with both Enda and Yuki when we are saying, you observing in your population that people are prepared to take hard decisions. People are prepared to make sacrifices. But it is also very important that we remember that whilst people are prepared to make sacrifices, they will not be sacrificed. And this is what we need to remember in all these austerity programs, that we, will, we must not sacrifice part of our population. We have this term 
for a long time saying that certain financial institutions, banks, they were too, too big to fail. But I think there's a lot of people who are feeling that they are too small to matter. And this is what we also need to focus on in times of austerity, that we also focus on uh, how we build things again and focus on the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you very much indeed. I'll, I'll take questions now. Could you please stand up, don't make a speech, uh, and identify yourself. Thank you. Can I see anybody with a question? In that case, we'll just carry on our conversation. Thank you. Ah, there is. Okay. Thank you. Would you like to stand up? I can't see you. Uh, John Eldham, UK. The biggest trade now is not north-south of the globe, but south-south. Could you speak up slightly, please? The biggest trade is not north-south of the globe, but south-south. Isn't all you're doing slowing the decline, not actually improving the relative position? Who wants to take that? Do you want to take that? Um, did you mean that... Uh, could you say it again because I didn't quite get the question. The growth in economy yes. and the trade is south-south in the globe, not north-south. Yes. And Europe is struggling to maintain its competitiveness. Mm. Um, asking the measures that you're taking, isn't that simply slowing the existing decline rather than reversing the competitive position? Well, <clears throat> as I have already said several times here, I think our our biggest weakness at the moment is the lack of confidence and therefore we have to strengthen our economies and there when we uh, when we talked about the austerity measures and uh, and the risk of social unrest we, we we also should see that the austerity measures can be those who can improve for instance job creations and competitiveness for instance in in some some of our countries and i don't want to mention any, any country by name but but the um, uh, labor market is very stagnated. And uh, that is one of the reasons why we have lost our confidence or some, the country has lost its confi uh, confidence and, and competitiveness in the global trade. So therefore, one of the best way to, to boost economic growth is to f make the labor market more flexible. It also uh, strengthen the, the countries or the companies' uh, capability to, to, uh, to make better in, in the global trade. So quite a lot can be done by improving uh, uh, competitiveness and, and doing structural reforms in our, our, our countries. And it does, by the way, it does not hit the growth at all. And this is also similar to what Taylor said, that it's very good news for the, for the people who are suffering at the lot and who are doing uh, uh, sacrifices at the moment when, when saying that we have to make our labor market more flexible because it would create jobs. And the job is a price of all what you suffer at the moment. Thank you very much. Another question? Uh, there's one in the center there with the gentleman. Um, um, Sean Oscar de Gossard from Belgium. I have a question. Is when you look at the governance of Europe, it, it, there's a, the institution at the top, the Commission, for example, have absolutely no electoral accountability. And it would not cross the mind of any prime minister in Europe to have as a governance system in its own country something which we're imposing to Europe or which we're living with for Europe. Is there any possibility that in the, you know, before I die or before I retire, we kind of move really forward in terms of institutions and uh, electoral accountability at the European level. Do you want to take that, Prime Minister? I, I, it's hard to hear your question, but as I understood, that means I can vent myself. Um, as I understood your question, it, uh, you asked, do we need more accountability for, for our institutions, for example, the Commission? This was what uh, you were asking. I used to be a member of the European Parliament. I was a member for five years, uh, great experience. It's an extraordinary uh, parliament, very unique parliament. A lot of people talk about a democratic deficit in, in Europe, and I agree, you could change things. There's always rooms for, room for improvement. But I'd like to point out two things. First of all, the European Parliament 
is, has that role of controlling the other institutions. And that's why we have to respect the European Parliament as a, as a body that actually controls other institutions. That one, that's one thing. The other thing, if you look at a small country like myself, like my own, if you look at a small country, I would always argue that a small member state like Denmark has actually gained influence on things happening in Europe which is directly um, changing the daily lives of Danish citizens. Does that mean that we have more democracy or less democracy? I would always argue that the Danes have got more influence on European affairs that has a direct influence on their everyday life. That means that being a member of the European Union, we have gained more democracy. President Comer, please. The yeah. European Parliament is directly elected. Uh, the members of the Parliament are elected by the people. And Lisbon, for instance, brought about a system of uh, co-responsibility between the Parliament and the Council of Ministers in a number of areas. So it is true what you say, Hella, that, that the people of small countries in the way, to, the way, to, the way the voting is done actually have a direct impact uh, in, the, in, the, in the context of decisions that are made at a European level. Um, I'm a supporter, I have to say, of the communitaire method that there be, that there be interaction uh, through, the, uh, through the Commission. And uh, I agree fully with uh, what's been said. Jobs and growth should be central to every agenda. The Nice Treaty said we should reduce red tape by 25%. We didn't do that. Why is that? Because you allow bureaucracy to go mad and produce thousands, of, uh, thousands and thousands of paragraphs that might not be as necessary as they are. I think we have to focus on that in the interests of clarity, decisiveness, and courage in the interest of what it is that we all believe Europe can become. The biggest trading bloc in the world, the enormous potential. Look at the demographics over the next 20 years. We need people to come in to run the services. We want to continue to invest in R&D and innovation, food security, global issue, enormous potential in Europe. These are places we should be. President Komorowski, briefly. I believe that there is deficit in terms of the strength of the connection between the European Union institutions and the voters in the member states of the European Union. However, this is the result of this stage of the European integration. Można sobie oczywiście wyobrażać teoretyczne różne rozwiązania, które by oznaczały ściślejsze wiązanie funkcjonujących instytucji europejskich, jak i Komisja Europejska, jak przewodnictwo z wyborami dokonywanymi w skali całej Europy, ale według mnie dzisiaj nikt w Europie, żaden kraj, żaden naród do takiego sposobu myślenia jeszcze no, nie dojrzał, czy nie, nie, nie widzi takiej potrzeby. Ale warto pamiętać o jednym, że tak patrząc na pokolenia europejskie, no to przecież pokolenie ojców założycieli Unii Europejskiej też w początku miała bardzo ograniczone aspiracje, jeśli chodzi o głębokość integracji europejskiej. I nikt sobie wtedy nie wyobrażał, że integracja europejska może dojść tak daleko, jak jest dzisiaj. I według mnie następne pokolenie będzie musiało odpowiadać sobie na Pana pytanie, czy iść dalej w kierunku pogłębienia siły związku między wyborcami w skali całej Europy a instytucjami europejskimi. Ale dzisiaj realizm podpowiada, że raczej należy zakrzykać pogłębianie integracji europejskiej poprzez funkcjonujące wzmacnianie istnienia na takich zasadach instytucji europejskie. Polska opowiadają się za metodą wspólnotową, jednak dostrzega szczególną rolę Komisji Europejskiej jako gwarancji pewnej skuteczności działania, ale także i reprezentacji wszystkich krajów członkowskich Unii Europejskiej, co oznacza też nasz punkt widzenia na przyszłość i na dzień dzisiejszy strefy euro.
President, just to pick up on that, I spent six years as a correspondent for the Financial Times in Brussels, 92 to 98. I watched the Commission at the height of its, the peak of its powers, when Jacques Delors was described as the philosopher king. <laughs> Would you not agree that the Commission, for better or worse, has been in decline ever since then? And as the union has got wider, we've moved more towards intergovernmentalism. Nie. No. <laughs> Dlatego, no. Dlatego, że because, gro kłopotów Unii Europejskiej uh, well, i instytucji europejskich nie da się związać z faktem poszerzania Unii o nowe kraje europejskie. Główne kłopoty Unii Europejskiej są związane właśnie ze starym obszarem Unii Europejskiej z przedwyższym. mówię to bez satysfakcji, aczkolwiek trudno je pod rozwagę. To nie tu jest problem. Nie dlatego Unię się trudniej zarządza, że jest większa ilość podmiotów, gdzie idzie są lokowane rzeczywiste źródła kryzysu zaufania. Deficit of democracy in the European Union. I suspect that this is a, a euphemism for uh, the European uh, bureaucracy or European Commission or European institutions being or becoming further and further away from the mainstream of European public opinion. Let's let me okay, hold formulate on, hold the on. question. Excuse me, sir. Can you just ask the question? Yes, this is the question. Yeah. To all of you, if you somehow miraculously were elected in a direct European election president of European Union, how would you excite the European people? Yeah, maybe we need a little less excitement, but that's another <laughs> matter. Uh, would you, as a former member of the European Parliament, you know all about direct elections? What would you do? To be honest, I don't think institutions are there to excite any, anyone. Institutions are there to make things work, to make the rule of law work, to get things done. We are policy makers and we need to push decisions that can improve the everyday lives of citizens. And I think it will not make any difference to a young person 25 years old, she just took her degree, and there's absolutely no chance for her to get a job. She still lives at home with her mom and dad. What makes her interested in our, in our, in, in our union? One thing, to get a job and to be able to provide for herself. That is what will change her life, and if we are to produce any successes, and if I was the president of anywhere, the universe, one thing I would, I would try to do is to create a job for all the young people that are unemployed in Europe right now. We are letting them down right now, and this is the main result that we should produce. Anybody else would like to be presi Thank yeah. Yeah. president I, I, of the I, union I, for a day? I, I agree with this. Um, obviously, if if an electorate of up to 500 million people were to cast their vote for a single personality or a list of candidates to be the president, uh, that personality would have to have the, the range to get people interested to the point where they can understand that political decisions can actually make a difference precisely for what Hella has said. Because the opportunity for young people to have a job, to contribute to the well-being of their economy and their country, and to live their lives is so fundamental that it's oftentimes missed by institutions. And that's where the driver of Europe were there to be a single president. It would be that role in encouraging, motivating governments to be part of the process of what can be the greatest trading bloc in the globe. America, the Far East, all depend upon the interconnectedness of the European Union. And for the for the presidency to, if you want to use the word excite, certainly motivate, interest other leaders in their respective countries as part of the union to be able to say, this is the future, we can create it, 
And the president in that theoretical situation could actually lead that momentum. But and it's all about what you say, jobs and the opportunity to contribute and live a life. But, but do you think, Prime Minister Kenny, that Europe should have a directly elected actually, president? Actually, my, my uh, party proposed this quite a number of years ago, um, <laughs> that there should be an, a directly elected president. It's not beyond, beyond realisation. I think a list of candidates from all of the countries Probably those in southern Spain might not have any interest in somebody in the far end of another country or whatever. But in theory, that person with a sufficiently strong personality could actually be a real motivator for leaders of countries in the Union to do the job for which they were elected. It's all about understanding that we're on the one conveyor belt, we have a mortal life to live here. Politics is a privilege, and leadership in politics is an even bigger privilege. But it's all about translating that influence down to the people, with them, uh, as Lincoln said, of, by, and for the people. President Komorowski, you're already president, uh, but... I go over my back. Ja nie sądzę, aby to było jakimś wielkim marzeniem well, kogokolwiek, aby sprawować władzę nad światem. The, uh, Ale powiem tak, że to jest chyba zadanie, żeby wybrać prezydenta Unii Europejskiej w wyborach bezpośrednich w skali całego kontynentu. No to jest zadanie przypominające wyliknie próbę ustalenia, który z klubów piłkarskich ma być, ma się cieszyć opinią, że jest najważniejszym, najlepszym, a nawet jedynym klubem w skali całej Europy. To chyba jest niewykonane. Ale pytanie, które padło, dotyczyło tego, czy czymś należy ekscytować ja rozumiem, domyślam się, że chodzi o to, czy są jakieś możliwe pokłady dobrych emocji, które mogłyby zachęcać do pogłębienia integracji europejskiej. Ja uważam, że tak. Uważam, że tak. I powiem w ten sposób. Pokolenie ojców założycieli Unii Europejskiej odwoływało się do wartości wtedy poruszającej ludzką wyobraźnię, jakim było bezpieczeństwo i perspektywa pokoju, a nie wojny. Kwestia bezpieczeństwa w krajach, które e, przez wiele lat miały deficyt poczucia bezpieczeństwa, w dalszym ciągu może być atrakcyjne. Na pewno w krajach o ustabilizowanych trzeba szukać takich, takich pomysłów, które by poruszały wyobraźnię społeczną, jak na przykład we Francji, gdy była mowa o tym, że będą tańsze telefony komórkowe. To porusza wyobraźnię młodych Europejczyków w krajach zamożnych, w krajach ustabilizowanych. Ale myślę, że jest jednak pewna cecha, który jest taki obszar, który może być obszarem wspólnych, pozytywnych emocji, dających jednak pewne poczucie misji, oprócz obowiązku szukania drogi do dobrobytu. Ja uważam, że to jest poczucie misji, jakim jest szerzenie mechanizmu demokratycznego. To jest tak ważne dla Polski, jest oddziaływanie na sąsiedztwo Unii Europejskiej, zarówno w wymiarze południowym, jak i wschodnim. Thank all our panelists for contributing to a fascinating debate. We've had glimpses, if not a little more, of a more pro prosperous and rebuilt Europe. Uh, we've heard a lot about the politics of austerity, but above all, we've understood that the basis must be for a restoration of trust, the, uh, the reinforcement and enforcement of rules. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening and contributing.